Hi, I'm Flumpty Bumpty. I'm in... No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm Jonathan, or Jonachrome, whatever you want to call me. And I made One Night at Flumpty's as a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game, and also as an inside joke. I've been overwhelmed by the response that this game has gotten already just in the first couple of days of its release, and I'm really thankful for how the community seems to have embraced it. So I'm kind of making this video as both a playthrough for people who can't beat the game themselves, and also as just kind of an insight into what this game even is, because it doesn't make any sense. Of course, it still won't make sense after I explain it, but, you know, whatever. The story begins more with Birthday Boy Blam, the little guy with the pizza hat, more so than it does with Flumpty, because my friends and I online made this ongoing group comic uh, with Microsoft Paint drawings, where one of us would make a few panels, someone else would pick the comic up from there, and we would just kind of make this stream of randomness that turned into some semblance of a story. And Birthday Boy Blam was kind of the origin of the story. And then he also met this other character who looked a lot like him, but had a monocle and a top hat. And I think a bow tie and suspenders. I'm not really sure exactly. And that was Kevin Jr. Even though there was no Kevin Sr., so whatever. I don't know where that idea came from. I don't know who came up with it, but... Um, I think in the story they were deter determined to be the same person, but in different time periods. So in this game... Uh, Blam turns into Kevin Jr. on camera 2B, and they're just kind of the same person. And then somewhere in the story, I decided to introduce Flumpty Bumpty as just this random character who comes in and buries them both because they happen to be unconscious in pits next to tombstones. And he just goes, Oh boy, I'm Flumpty Bumpty. Oh wow, there are people in these holes. I know what to do. I've always wanted to try this. And then he just accumulates a shovel out of nowhere and buries a giant pile of dirt on them. And as our comic story became more and more convoluted, I realized that the only way to explain everything that was going on was for Flumpty to be immune to the plot. So he just announces that he is and then flies away. So I realized that if Flumpty is immune to the plot and he's a fictional character and can therefore be in any story ever if he wants to be, then he can pretty much just bend the rules of time and space. He doesn't even have to follow the rules. So he's just this all-powerful egg who goes around killing people because he feels like it. And if you read the newspaper that The Beaver was reading, then it says that Flumpty kidnapped a person because he felt like it, and that person is supposed to be the player of the game. And you've been brought to Flumpty's House of Horrors, or whatever this place is supposed to be. I don't even know what it is. And someone asked me, if Flumpty can transcend time and space, then why is it that metal doors stop him? And honestly, they don't. It's just a limitation that he's given himself to make this experience more fun. In my mind, the story of this game is that Flumpty kidnaps you and wants to play a game with you, and if you survive, you become best friends. Flumpty does not have the best social skills. But then, I was... Addicted to Five Nights at Freddy's, mostly because of Markiplier, and that's why I decided to put his logo on the newspaper that the beaver is reading. And I wanted to make some kind of Five Nights at Freddy's fan game, but I didn't know what kind of game to make it. And then all of a sudden I just told my friend, Dude, Five Nights at Flumpty's. And so the idea immediately stuck, and I started working on it, but I decided to change it to One Night instead of Five. Because that was one way of making this different from other Five Nights at Freddy's fan games that exist, and also I felt like it would have the appeal that Slender used to, where every time you played the game again it got constantly worse towards the end, but you wanted to reach the end. And honestly, the Five Nights at Freddy's formula to me is already so perfect to begin with that I felt like it was pretty much impossible to come up with original ideas for this. But I still tried my best to put kind of my own spin on this game, and I decided maybe that uh, it could utilize the cameras more than other fan games might. But I just had to copy the Foxy mechanic from the first Five Nights at Freddy's because I was just too happy with the idea of replacing Foxy with someone who is running out of toilet paper. Uh, I asked my friend Josiah Clark on Twitter, Hey, if you put a living creature on a toilet, what would it be? And he said a beaver. And then I interpreted that as the abomination that you see in this game. Oh, I should add, almost everything in the main room of the game, 
like the detailed map of Utah and the toaster and the puddle of vomit and the brain. That was a result of me direct messaging my friend Jake on Twitter, he's Metroidman347, and also the one who made the death scream sound effect for this game, which I could not do any better. Um, I just asked him to name off random objects, and so he did, and then I drew them all. And I am pleased with the result. And he gifted me the first two Five Nights at Freddy's games through Steam, which I am very thankful for. And he's just all around a cool guy. The weird skeleton guy who comes to the left door at one point is the Redman, also known as the man who drank lava and lived kinda. His design was one that I came up with a long time ago whenever I was trying to make a horror game, but I had no idea what kind of horror game to make, and then the idea just kind of collapsed. But I still liked the design, so I kept it, and then I used it in this game. I figured his arrival sometime after 3am in this game would be kind of an indicator that the game just got real, because he's so completely out of place from everything you've seen up until that point. Uh, for the record, Flumpty and Blam become active almost immediately in the night. Blam follows a set path. Flumpty is completely random. He can show up at the left door at any time. But if you close the door, then he leaves faster. And the Redman also follows a set path, but it's a different path from Blam's. The Beaver technically starts becoming active at 1am, but he doesn't really do anything until about 2 or 3. And he charges at the door every 2 or 3 hours, I guess. So he's a lot less sporadic than Foxy. And then, I already had the beaver, and I already had the redman, so I didn't want to name the clown the clown, so I named it Grunkfus, because that's the first thing that came to my mind. He gets a little bit closer every time you lift the camera up, and if you lift it up too many times, then you die. And you can tell how many times you have left by looking at the number of eyes in the pit on camera 5. And that might be too subtle, but it was a cool idea to me at least. I thought about just having Ronald McDonald crawl out of the poster on the left, but I wanted to utilize the hole in the wall in some way, so I changed it. And Grunkfus is totally a better clown. Before I really started brainstorming ideas for this game, I thought that maybe all the monsters could just be variations of Flumpty, just different Easter eggs. And I didn't end up using that idea because I thought it might be a little bit too repetitive, but I was excited for the idea of Golden Flumpty because I thought I wanted something like Golden Freddy in the game, and I realized that Flumpty is an egg and there are golden eggs, so I put that in the game, and I kind of accidentally based his design off a boss in Persona 4, which I haven't played, but anyone who has played it might know what I'm talking about. This game was a lot of fun for me to make, but it was also quite a challenge for me to make, because it's not like anything else I've made in the past. I've never really made games where death is much of a consequence before, and I've also never made a full game in Game Maker Studio before, I'd always used Flash. And so that's a little bit of a different experience. And I'd also never made a horror game before, so I managed to jump scare myself plenty of times making this. I also learned new sound design techniques, which is something I'd never really thought deeply about in the past. And I also had this self-imposed artistic challenge to not include any green on the characters or in the environment of this game. So, there's no green anywhere. Jake told me to draw a cactus, I made it blue. And even though I considered this kind of a side project to other things I was working on, I was really invested in it and ended up finishing it in about 19 days. It was 20 days from the concept to completion and release, except there was one day in which I had to work on an English paper, so that was dumb. There were a few ideas that I had for this game that I didn't end up using, like um, Jake making a phone call saying that he was Jake from State Farm sometime in the middle of the night, but I felt like that would kind of detract from the mood too much, so I didn't keep that idea. And then the Max A Few Trades said something about rap music playing in the distance upon seeing the beaver, and then I thought about maybe including that, but I didn't. I thought about making it so that if you clicked on the nose of the Ronald McDonald poster, it honks like uh, Freddy's nose in Five Nights at Freddy's, but I didn't do that. And then the thought also crossed my mind of making a, an unlockable Night 2 that's just the same thing but harder. Except I really don't think it's worth it. I think it's fine how it is, so... Don't expect that. So, this was an enlightening and enjoyable project for me to work on, and I can't thank Scott Cawthon enough for making Five Nights at Freddy's and being such an inspiration to me to pursue making original things, 
but I had to make this unoriginal thing first, so there you go. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you later. Hello everyone, and welcome to the One Night at Flumpty's 2 developer commentary. I have a lot of things that I want to say, and I don't know how to get through it all, but I'm going to start by saying that whenever I made the first One Night at Flumpty's, I really just made it as a joke. I didn't try to make it super original, I didn't expect it to get the following that it did. Uh, it was just me parodying Five Nights at Freddy's with a character that I made up with my friends a year ago, and apparently people enjoyed the first game enough to want a sequel, and so I started thinking about one. But one problem that I had with One Night at Flimpy's personally was I didn't really feel like it was original enough. It was too derivative of Five Nights at Freddy's. So I thought if I was going to make a sequel, I wanted to make it something new, something fresh that hopefully people haven't seen before or played before. And I didn't really have many ideas. The only idea that I had at the time was the idea of replacing the phone call and the fan in the background of Five Nights at Freddy's with a record player that plays music. And I liked that idea, and I wanted to use it, but I didn't have anything else to really go on. Until one night, not at Flumpty's, but at a relative's house that I wasn't really used to staying in, I couldn't really sleep very well, and whenever I finally did get to sleep, I only slept about an hour, because I had a nightmare. In the nightmare, I was in a sort of garage-type place, and there was a light switch in front of me that turned the lights in the garage on and off. But then there was also a hallway in front of me, that sometimes monsters of some variety, I don't know what they looked like because I don't remember, but sometimes monsters would come by and they would look into the room, and if the light was off then they wouldn't see me, but one time I had the light on and one of them just charged at me and I woke up abruptly and I thought, well, I guess that must be a One Night at Flumpty's 2 dream because I can't imagine what else that would be. And I just took it as a sign that apparently One Night at Flumpty's 2 has to exist. So I started drawing the quote-unquote office of the game. The office alone took about a week to draw, and I called upon my friend Jake, or Metroidman347, one more time to tell me what kind of random crap that I should draw in the room, and I came up with a lot of ideas myself this time for things to draw, but a lot of it still came from him. Which reminds me, in the first game there was the cactus that I made blue because, aside from a few exceptions, I decided to try to avoid green as much as possible in the first game. Uh, in this game I avoided the color blue, and I have a blue whale that I intentionally made green, just because. But yeah, I drew the room, and it is very similar to how it looked in my dream, and then I decided to add vents to it because... Taste Gaming made a video on the first one out of Flumpty's, and he had the suggestion that maybe the beaver in that game, who works like Foxy, uh, might be, it might be cool if he came from either door, the left one or the right one in the game, instead of just always coming down the same hallway. And I decided to incorporate that idea into One Night at Flumpty's 2 with events and the owl, and I really think that was a good idea, and I thank him for that. Go check him out, he's a very jolly guy. But then, at around this time, I kind of lost some steam with the project, because I played Five Nights at Freddy's 2 for the first time, and it made me realize that the ideas that I'd been coming up with for the game weren't really original enough, and perhaps weren't intuitive enough either. The initial ideas that I had for this game were for the characters to just kill you on the spot if they saw you and your light wasn't off. And I also thought about having Grunkfist the Clown just be another wind-up music box thing, but that idea has been kind of done to death in fan games at this point, and I also don't really like that mechanic to begin with anyways, because I feel like it, there's too much maintenance with it, you have to worry about it every single second. I didn't know what to do, so I took a break, and I had another inspiring dream. This time it was a Super Mario Sunshine 2 dream for some reason. And in the dream, any time Mario was seen by an enemy, there was a bar in the bottom right corner that increased, and whenever it reached full, all the enemies started attacking him. Just kind of think like, all the enemies attacking him like the cuckoos in Ocarina of Time attack Link. So I wake up from the dream, I think that was weird, and then about seven or eight hours pass, and I think, wait a minute, I can use that idea! And so that's how the exposure meter got into the game, and it's in the same place that it was in my dream. And I felt like just incorporating that added this 
new realm of possibility to the game. Another thing about Freddy's 2 that I don't care as much about is how how much of the game is based on quick reflexes, because in the later nights, if you make a split-second error, then you're dead. And I felt like the exposure meter kind of prevented that from happening with my game, and that's one thing I liked about it. One thing that I love in the first Five Nights at Freddy's is the power mechanic, because everything that you do affects the power, and at the end of the night, it's so much more tense than the beginning because you have almost no power left. And I really like that feeling of tension, and I felt like the exposure bar and how it can never go down kind of helped to bring that feeling of tension back that I kind of missed from the second game, and to an extent the third one as well. One thing that I deeply appreciate about the first Five Nights at Freddy's that isn't so present in the second one is how every character is unique in how they function in the game. You can kind of develop this weird relationship with each one of them individually because they all behave differently, but in the second game there's less of that because more of them behave the same way. So that's kind of a rule that I set up for myself, is I wanted every character to be uniquely distinguishable by the way they behave. One of the common complaints with Five Nights at Freddy's and its fan games is that the camera doesn't really have enough of a use. I wanted to change that with my game. I sort of tried that with the first game, but I didn't really put the same effort into it as I did this one. And so the owl is one reason to look at the cameras. Grunkfist the Clown, I decided to have a timer that you had to pay attention to um, for him. And then I also added the Red Man pop-up. I thought that that was kind of a fun idea. And as for other characters like Blam and the Eyesore, it's helpful to look at the cameras for those characters because you can just turn off the light really fast if they're coming, but if you know that they're coming, then you don't have to waste any exposure at all. So I guess for posterity, I can try to explain how all the characters work in detail. Flumpty starts moving almost right away, but he doesn't actually have a chance of entering your room for the first, I think, 30 seconds. Like in the first game, every time he moves, it's to a completely random location, and he has, I think, a 15% chance of entering your room. And I knew that if I was going to have Flumpty be completely random in this game, I needed to have some kind of delay before he makes your exposure go up, and so I added a peekaboo animation that I hope is quick enough to be startling, but slow enough that you can respond to it without raging at the game. The owl is also active almost right away, partly so that you can learn how the owl works, and also because if the owl wasn't active almost right away, then there wouldn't be a reason to ever turn the lights on, so I felt like that was important. The owl will stay in camera 3. If you don't see him in camera 3 anymore, then he's in one of the two vents in camera 4 or 5, and whichever one he's going down, you close that vent in the room. He's a little bit more likely to go to the vent that is open than the one that is closed, but he can go through either at any time. If you happen to look at the camera that the owl isn't going through, then you can just close that vent and you're given extra time before the owl hits the, the vent. Birthday Boy Blam becomes active around 1 o'clock, and he makes a constant cycle around camera 6, camera 3, and camera 7, and then he enters the room again. He just makes a circle, and if you see him in his Kevin Jr. fancy attire in camera 7, then that means he's about to enter the room. If you see him disappear from that screen, then you have a really short span of time before he actually enters the room and sees you, so you can turn off the light in that time. And you shouldn't ever have to do this, but you can turn the light on if he's starting to walk away, because he's not looking at you anymore. When you see the hole up here on the left side of the room, that means that Grunkfus is starting to lose his patience. You can see what his patience level is in camera 2, the moment it hits zero, he will pop out of the hole in the wall on the left, and your exposure will go up faster than it will for Flumpty or Blam because he's closer to you, so it's more easy for him to be aware that you're there. And because the game runs at 30 frames per second, which is a choice that I made because it made the game run faster, the timer also goes down 30 every second, so that might help you keep a mental note of how fast it's going down. Redman.exe, just a pop-up, click cancel when it appears. If you don't, then you'll have a few seconds to see a red screen of death, and then he'll kill you. I programmed the pop-up where it shouldn't ever appear whenever it's impossible to click cancel. You should always have time to react to it before any of the characters look at you in the room. The Eyesore, kind of and kind of not a character returning from the first game, he will stay in camera 1, but if you see him crawling out of the hole in camera 1, then that means he will start coming towards you in the next minute or two. Then he will move to camera 3, and then camera 6, and then to your room. 
in a relatively rapid fashion, so you want to make sure that if you see him in either of those cameras, he will be at the room in about 20 seconds or less. In the normal mode, he'll only appear once, sometime after 4am, but in hard-boiled mode, he's much more active. And then the last character is Golden Flumpty. He starts having a reasonable chance of showing up after 4.30 or so, and if you look at him for too long without either turning off the light or flipping up the laptop screen, then he will kill you, kind of like Golden Freddy does. There are a few recurring questions that I have seen with the characters, like, why doesn't the eyesore move around in the first game? And that's because whenever I made the first game, the pile of eyes in the floor in that one room, it, it's just a pile of eyes. That's how I drew it. It wasn't intended to be a character. But then people thought it was a character, and I thought maybe I could turn it into a character. And it took me a while to come up with a design to match those eyes, because everything that I came up with was just kind of like that monster in Monty Python on the Holy Grail that has a whole bunch of eyes. But then I thought of the idea that I once had, where the eyes represent people that Flumpty has killed in his game of bringing people into his house and having them survive the night. So I had the terrifying idea of just making the eyes a beast of corpses, and I made it a dinosaur because I liked the pun eyesore. The eyesore character is elaborated on a little bit in the newspaper that you get after hard-boiled mode. And another big question is where did the beaver go? Because the beaver is the only character in the first game who doesn't reappear in the second one. I just really wanted the eyesore to be a character, and I valued the balance of the game's mechanics over total consistency between the games. So whenever I brought Eyesore into the game as a character that moves around, and whenever I replaced the beaver with an owl because owls can see in the dark, and that made sense with the whole turning off the light mechanic, I didn't really have room to put the beaver in the game and have it still make the game feel nice. So I have an easter egg in the game that shows up rarely if you start it up, where you just see a gravestone that says the beaver is dead because he fell down the toilet. I just knew people were going to ask about the beaver, so I had to come up with some kind of explanation for why he's not there, and that is the explanation that I came up with, as stupid as it is. In addition to the beaver, there was actually another character that I scrapped for the game, who uh, was a blind character. I just thought about having a blind character wander from camera one, eventually reaching your room, and then just kind of wandering past it. And the idea was that if you didn't make any noise, then he wouldn't notice you. But I ditched that idea because sound doesn't really play nearly as huge of a role as the light does, and it would really slow down the gameplay to just not do anything as he passes by, and uh, I might recycle the idea of a blind monster into another game someday. Maybe not a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game, but just a game sometime, because... Not that I'm the first one to come up with the idea of a blind monster, I just think it would be cool to try and see if I could use that sometime. As far as hard-boiled mode goes, I didn't think that if I was going to make a sequel to One Night at Flumpty's that I was going to have two nights, because it just kind of feels weird to have a second night if the whole idea is that it's one night. But I guess whenever I made this game and I felt like it wasn't something that people had played before, I wanted to see what people would do with a hard mode. Like, if I made a hard-boiled mode of the first One Night at Flumpty's, which I won't, I don't know what would make it any different from Night 6 or Night 7 of Five Nights at Freddy's, but this actually felt different to me, and so I was happy to make a hard-boiled mode also just to see how I enjoyed it myself and how much trouble I would have with it. And it was kind of crazy to me because I programmed the whole game not really actually playing it until it was almost done. I just tested bits and pieces of it along the way, but until the end, it didn't all come together and I didn't actually play it for myself. I was impressed with how it turned out. I didn't expect it to be as tense as it is. And I feel like I must have gotten lucky with it, because one of the hardest things for me to do is make a game that I still want to play after I've spent a long time working on it. But I got addicted to hard-boiled mode and tweaking parts of it to make sure that it was possible. I promised myself that unless I beat hard-boiled mode myself, I wouldn't release the game, and so it took me about three hours, but I did it. The recording you're seeing now is my second time beating it. People have a strategy where they just keep the lights off as much as possible and only really pay attention to the owl and 
the red man pop up, and maybe also Grunkfist the Clown. And I guess that's a strategy that works. I don't think it's 100% reliable. I prefer to play the game paying attention to all the enemies at once, but, you know, play it however you think works. I kind of think of One Night at Flumpty's 1 as a parody game, and I see this one also as sort of a parody, but more as a tribute. Because I admire Scott Cawthon's work with Five Nights at Freddy's so much, just because of their game mechanics and how they're different every time. I like the story of the games too, but it's not really the biggest appeal to me compared to the game mechanics, and that's probably part of the reason why I didn't really focus on the story as much in making One Night at Flumpty's. But making this game was kind of my way of saying, this is what I feel like I've learned from playing Five Nights at Freddy's and being inspired by the games. Whereas the first One Night at Flumpty's was more or less a joke, I really poured myself into this one and I took it seriously as a project. To kind of cap it all off, uh, whenever I had the record player idea, I knew that I wanted just light, happy classical music to be playing in the background as something that shouldn't be creepy, but it is. And I just kind of made this mock-up classical music that's not a reference to anything in particular. But then for hard-boiled mode, I had the idea to remake the Toreador March, or the Toreador song, which is a tune from an opera, but it's also the tune that plays when Freddy appears at the door in Five Nights at Freddy's 1, and it was so much fun to remake it in a classical-ish style. So that's another homage to Scott Cawthon's genius. For the people who have asked, I made the artwork in these games with Flash 8. That's kind of my art program of choice, and animation program. Uh, the game itself is made with Game Maker Studio, mostly using GML, not so much drag-and-drop stuff. And I'm not sure that anyone's asked this, but the music in both games was all made in FL Studio. So, I'm very happy with how this game turned out. It turned out better than I expected. I'm hesitant to say that I'm proud, because while I can practically credit the whole creative process of the game to myself, there's still so many people that I have to thank because without them, this game would not exist. I want to thank WWW Wario for making Five Nights at Wario's, because the moment I saw that, I was inspired to make One Night at Flumpty's, because I realized that it would be fun to make, and if Five Nights at Wario's exist, then why not Flumpty's? Both of those are kind of equally absurd concepts, although I don't mean that in a bad way, I just think it's fun. And I also just think that WWW Wario, or Andy, is a very nice guy, and he was supportive of One Night at Flumpty's 2, and so I had to thank him both in the special thanks in the menu of the game, and also I decided to draw his morphed Five Nights at Wario's Luigi um, in the background of one of my One Night at Flumpty's 2 rooms. Again, Taste Gaming without his spur-of-the-moment idea to have a foxy mechanic with two hallways. Without that, this game probably wouldn't exist either. I have Daco to thank for being supportive. I have Dalek Puncher to thank for the Red Man scream. I brought up on Twitter that I didn't have any uh, jump scare screams for One Night at Flumpty's 2 yet, and I wanted there to be multiple ones. I didn't want them to all sound the same this time. And Dalek Puncher gave me a sound that I had to edit a little bit, but it worked perfectly. So big props to him for that. That was really helpful. I have my friends to thank, like Jake, for the assistance of the creation of Flumpty Bumpty, and he was helpful in the beta testing process, even though this game didn't have much of a beta testing process. And again, just Scott Cawthon, just... He's inspired me in ways that I would have never thought possible, from a game in a genre that I used to not even really care for. He's a truly amazing guy, and I wish him the best. As a side note, people have asked here and there to see the comic that I made with my friends where Flumpty Bumpty and Birthday Boy Blam originated, but a lot of that comic was lost a while back, and I don't think it's retrievable, so I'm sorry about that. I don't even remember how Flumpty and Blam met. It had nothing to do with Five Nights at Freddy's, I can tell you that much. Now, one more big question that's on people's minds is, will there be a One Night at Flumpty's 3? I can't entirely dismiss the possibility of one, but I don't think I'll make one. It's just that this one took a lot out of me, and I feel like everything that I really wanted to do with the first One Night at Flumpty's that I didn't, I ended up doing with the second one.
the response that this one has gotten has been unreal. It's the top-rated game, or top-rated Five Nights at Freddy's game on Game Jolt right now, which is a huge honor. And it feels like if I made another one, then it would only go downhill from here, and I don't think I would have as much fun making it either. I don't want to feel like I'm obligated to make a third One Night at Flumpty's just because there are three Five Nights at Freddy's games. And if there's a fourth Five Nights at Freddy's game somewhere in the future, then would I have to make a fourth One Night at Flumpty's? I just want to be able to work on original projects. Because after all, Five Nights at Freddy's was an original project. That wasn't a fan game of anything. Scott made that on his own merit, and... I like making fan games, but I want to focus on projects that aren't fan games. So... I guess we'll see how that works out. Anyways, say what you will about Five Nights at Freddy's, but the community surrounding the series is one of the most amazing groups of people I've ever known, and I am incredibly grateful for the opportunities that I've been given to have so much fun making these fan games and to see people enjoy them the way that they do. It's really been a wild ride. So thank you all very much for watching and playing, and I will see you in whatever we do next. Disclaimer. Instead of this video being a pure developer commentary over gameplay footage like the ones made for the first two games, it will be a fully edited video essay in which I spend most of it talking about the development of One Night of Flumpty's 3. This video will contain spoilers and viewer discretion is advised. About 13 years ago now, on the forum I used to frequent, I invented an imaginary user with the name Popular Guy. And the running gag was that every message this user posted would receive at least a dozen upvotes, regardless of what it said. I had to find an avatar for this character I invented, and on a whim, I did an image search for Humpty Dumpty, I'm not really sure why, and found this, which it turns out is from a bit on The Muppet Show. I couldn't tell you why this image worked so well for Popular Guy, but the joke was well received, and I wouldn't be surprised if it left an impression on me that subconsciously led to Flumpty Bumpty years later, who I similarly invented on a whim as a joke. It never would have occurred to me that his popularity would grow to the degree that it has today. One Night at Flumpty's 3, for me, is the end of a very long joke that took on a life of its own. I've made no secret of the conflicting feelings I've had about this goofy little series, but I know I'm not alone when I say it's a rough feeling when your most successful creation, or at least one of them, is something you didn't put your heart into. I made the first game in about three weeks to practice software I'd never used before. Not only was it a test parody game based on a series I really only had a passing interest in about five years ago, its cast is entirely made up of characters most people seem to have more passion about than I do. A lot of artists refer to their original characters as their children because of how much love and care they put into them, and I definitely feel that way about some of my own characters. But I've never had that experience with Flumpty or Blam or the others. For me, they're just kind of a means to an end. All of this is to say, when I found Scott Cawthon's email about the Fazbear Fanverse initiative in my trash folder, the reason it was there at all is because I had filters in place to automatically delete emails about Flumpty and FNAF, because I had no expectations of doing anything with either of them again. In fact, I had also deleted all the source files for the first two games, which made it more difficult when I had to remove all the copyrighted material from them for the official releases, because somebody had to decompile the games for me, and after that, the only way for me to edit the images was to draw over them. So that was fun. I joined the initiative knowing I didn't have to make a third game if I didn't want to. Even still, to me it only made sense to try, because of course, one last game to tie up loose ends for the fans and for myself would make the whole thing more special. So I got started, and this is going to sound strangely familiar, but I started with a dream I had. A few years back, probably about four years ago now, three or four, I don't know exactly, I had a dream about a hypothetical third Flumpty game that took place in an empty cabin on a mountain with a blizzard outside. On each of the four walls of this cabin was a wide open door Flumpty and Blam would sometimes appear behind, and just looking at them was enough to make them vanish back into the storm. If I had directly translated the stream into game form, the gameplay would have been garbage, because all you'd have to do is spin around in a circle and you'd win. Still, 
I liked the idea of a real third game taking place in a freezing cold environment, so I made the office a freezer and turned the temperature into a mechanic. In hindsight, I realize the furnace is pretty similar to the music box in FNAF 2, which I have some reservations about, but my hope was that it would feel like a safe zone for the player at first, and then I would introduce a mechanic which shows that not even the one safe zone is truly safe, like any good horror. I knew early on that I wanted to bring back the whole gang from the first two games without introducing any new characters, because this final game is sort of their curtain call. I briefly tried to work in the blind monster I left out of Flumpties 2, but the idea didn't fit then, it didn't fit this time either, it would have felt forced, and it was simply not meant to be. The reason Empty Bempty is not in the game, by the way, is because by the time I announced the game, it was actually already finished, and I just made it sound like it hadn't been started yet because I wanted to give Click Team more time for the ports without people complaining. I don't know, it, it took a long time anyway. Either way. Empty Bempty was added to the first game after the third one was already finished, and it was just meant to be a little bonus anyway, nothing really important. Blam, as is tradition, is pretty neutral. He follows a path to the office, and you know he's about to enter when he has the Kevin Jr. pose. Golden Flumpty has always been a reference to Golden Freddy, who is a hallucination. Turning him into a hallucination like the ones in FNAF 3 just made sense in my head. Someone had to come out of the furnace, and the red man seemed like the obvious choice because he's associated with fire and lava, although the idea of having him teleport through a portal in the wall was sort of carried over from the Grunkfist portals in the cancelled One Week at Flumpty's plans. Several things were carried over from those plans, one of the most obvious things being the snapshot camera, which I repurposed for use in the office instead of the security cameras because... I wanted to force players to use the monitor to determine when a character is right outside, and lighting up the darkness in front of you with a flash of light just seemed like a cool way of fending them off. When balancing the game, I felt like there needed to be more of a reason to make every snapshot deliberate, which is why if you flash the light at Grunkfist the impatient clown, he attacks you unlike the other characters. It also worked out well, because the room Grunkfist comes out of this time is an exhibit for clown art which is an idea I was rather happy with, and it makes sense for an art exhibit to have a sign prohibiting flash photography. There was no way I couldn't bring back both the beaver and the owl this time, but one thing I didn't want to carry over from the cancelled one-week plans was the toilet paper mummy beaver idea, because I knew everybody would be expecting that, and I was right! I also tried to find a way to implement both characters separately without their mechanics being identical, because having every character behave in a unique way is just my preference, but nothing I came up with felt natural. I eventually had the idea to kill off the owl like I killed off the beaver, and combine the corpses of these two functionally very similar characters into one twisted-looking chimera, which felt nice and spooky and didn't sacrifice gameplay. I think Eyesore was the last character whose mechanic I came up with for the first night, because by that point it felt like I'd covered all the bases with the other characters, and I didn't know what else to add that would maintain the balance of the mechanics. Most likely what led to me putting Eyesore in the door was the fond, eerie mental image of all those eyes staring at you from the darkness, and I'd say it serves as a nice extra incentive not to look at the security cameras for too long. The number one idea that I absolutely wanted to bring back from the cancelled one-week plans was a hectic night dedicated entirely to Flumpty with a dramatic shift in tone. Flumpty Night, as I call it, was the whole reason I wanted to make a third game in the first place, even six years ago. After all, Flumpty is the namesake of the series. He's immune to the plot, he can transcend time and space. He really should be the scariest character, and I did everything in my power to make that happen. The end result, in my opinion, is even better than I'd always hoped it would be. I'm glad I didn't design this night in the one week at Flumpty's days, because I've learned a lot, and I was able to capture exactly the mood I wanted back then, just with better gameplay that handles a lot of the same elements in a different way. I brought back the rooms that swap places on the map, the starry hallway, the laser doors, the room decorated with a bunch of glowing lines. The addition of the dinosaur is my friend's idea. This night combines a lot of new ideas with the best of the plans I had before, and it doubled as fan service, so that's great. It was cathartic, 
in particular to animate the spider-legged Flumpty scampering through the vents because that imagery had been in my head for years, and I was so eager to make it a reality that I'm pretty sure it's one of the first things I made when I got to work on Flumpty Night. I was also excited to make the jump scare because Flumpty is more or less a reality-bending god of death. <laughs> so I wanted to make his jump scare look like a Lovecraftian nightmare. Beyond that, I really didn't go in with much of a plan. I just kept writing down ideas in a notebook and adding them along the way until it became utter chaos. Before I really started brainstorming ideas for this game, I thought that maybe all the monsters could just be variations of Flumpty, just different Easter eggs. Not gonna lie, I completely forgot I said this until people reminded me after the third game came out. There was one idea I remember having for Flumpty Night that I didn't include, which was the idea that sometimes the game would randomly appear to lock up or reset or go back to the title screen, like the sanity effects in Eternal Darkness. But as quirky and fitting as that might sound on paper, in practice it would have disrupted the gameplay too much and quickly gotten annoying, so the only sanity effect I implemented was the heads-up display glitching out. The decision to compose an electro swing song for the end of the night came to me while I was listening to Caravan Palace. Go figure. I wanted to greatly outdo the little jingle in the second game while also making reference to it, and I actually thought it would lighten the mood at the end of the night, but after putting it in I think it just made things more intense, which is even better. I think it wraps up all the mayhem in a nice little bow, and I'm very pleased with how it came out. Flumpty Night is really the climax of the game, and even though hard-boiled mode is meant to be the hardest of the three nights, I didn't go out of my way to make it the hardest challenge it possibly could be, because narratively it's the falling action, it's the farewell to the characters, and I wanted people to actually be able to beat the night and see the true ending. In Five Nights at Freddy's 3, which always felt like the proper ending of that series to me, the background music of the Shadow Bonnie minigame was a music box cover of a classical piece by Schubert, which in English basically translates to Swan Song No. 4, Serenade. I used that same music box theme in the cancellation video for the One Week at Flumpty's game years ago, and it felt appropriate to sort of call back to that for the bittersweet final night of the series. So I made my own cover of Schubert's Serenade, and that's what plays in the game. One of the big reasons the One Week at Flunty's game crashed and burned is I was trying to force lore into a fan game series that I think actually benefits from not having any lore, so the story was not a focus in this one. But it does have just a little bit more story than the others, and I think it fits. It occurred to me that the goal of the player has always been to survive until 6am, and technically the Flumpty series has never ended a night on 6am. The first game ended with Ham, the second game ended with Spam, but never Six. It also occurred to me that this series is called One Night at Flumpty's, and Flumpty is above the laws of time, so I could make the argument that every night in the series is the same one night being reset over and over again with different rules until 6am finally arrives and you're free. I was happy with that idea, and it resonated with me on a personal level as well, because in some ways, I've felt trapped with Flumpty, and have been waiting for a feeling of release to move on to new things. The final shot of One Night at Flumpty's 3 is a callback to the image I used in the trailer for the first game, and it's the very same shot I had planned to end the One Week at Flumpty's game with. Incidentally, now that I've added a hard-boiled mode to the first game, it has two nights, the second game has two nights, and the third game has three nights. That adds up to seven nights, which is one week. So, in an unexpected, roundabout way, we did get to spend one week at Flumpty's after all, and I was able to end it how I always wanted. If I'm being honest in regards to both Flumpty's and the Fazbear Fanverse initiative, it feels like I have more negative memories than positive ones, and maybe that's just because the negative ones stand out more easily. 
I've felt torn about my relationship with these games, and I think all the fanverse developers agree that the initiative could have been handled way better than it has been, with unclear communication being perhaps the biggest issue of all. But hopefully, since my games have been the first ones in the lineup, I've run into the most of the major problems, and the experience will go more smoothly for the others. Major shout-out, by the way, to Phil Morg, who is also part of the fanverse developing FNAF+. Plus. I have no idea why Click Team was given the unreasonable task of porting multiple games that weren't made in their own software, but Phil came along and did all the remaining necessary work for the Flumpty ports. He made a stylish menu for the console bundle, and he even found and fixed a few minor glitches that slipped under the radar. I could not have asked for anyone better for the job, and he's frankly the sole reason Flumpty's 3 came out before the death of the universe, so I'm very thankful, very, very, very thankful for his help. An additional shout-out to Etches Sketchy, who is a good friend of mine, and also quite possibly the biggest Flumpty fan I've ever known. She has her own original characters who were initially inspired by the One Night at Flumpty's cast, but they're not even fan characters, they're her own distinct characters in her own world that she's creating, and that to me is even more flattering and cool, and she really made the release of the game more rewarding with her infectious enthusiasm. I'd also, of course, like to thank Scott Cawthon for this opportunity. Even though there have been times when I've felt like I don't belong and maybe I shouldn't have joined the initiative at all, and there have been times when I've been confused and frustrated and likely difficult to work with. Scott has been patient with me, he's educated me on certain things, and kept my best interest in mind the whole time. Ultimately, when all is said and done, I'm glad that I made One Night at Flumpty's, I'm glad that I joined the fanverse, and I think through this initiative, Scott has made a lot of people's lives a little brighter. Yeah, this is pretty much where my relevance with the fanverse ends, with the possible exception of merch in the future, although I still don't know whether that'll happen or not, so we'll see. My last Flumpty uploads will be the One Night at Flumpty's 3 soundtrack, and then I'll start a new journey. If you're still interested in Five Nights at Freddy's content, you won't be seeing it from me, but you will be seeing it with the other members in the fanverse, so if that tickles your fancy, please buy their games when they come out. They're all cool people with wonderful creative skill, and they deserve your support. With that said, take care, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in whatever we do next. <laughs>